Welcome to the Startup Grind. Um, Startup Grind is a startup community um, based out of California. Uh, and our sole purpose is to educate, to inspire, and to connect entrepreneurs. And we do that through a series of monthly events like this one. There's a live monthly event uh, interview series that we have every month. Um, we are now in 100 cities in 42 countries. So events like this are taking place all over the world. We also have an annual event that takes place in February in California. If anyone has any interest in that, I can give you more information about that because I know we're coming to the close of uh, the, um, the early bird ticket price for that event. But again, i um, just like to welcome you here to start a drawing. I'm excited that we have a guest tonight. Uh, some of you know and some of you don't know. Uh, Christiane Smith uh, from Design Smith Studio. She is the owner and the principal of Design Smith. Christiane and I have known each other for a while now, actually almost a year, almost as long as uh, Startup Run Albany has been in, in existence. So just ask you to kind of sit back, uh, relax. We're going to have an awesome time. But before you relax completely, I want to invite you to rise to your feet and help me because I want you to help me give a Startup Albany Run welcome to Christiane Smith. Come on up, Christiane. <laughs> My dear, I'm so excited that we have this opportunity to come together. We've talked, we've had lunch, um, but this will be an opportunity for us to really kind of share um, the story behind the story. Uh, folks know you from different uh, different areas of your life. I know your parents are here and you've got friends and supporters and colleagues. Um, and so I just wanted to have an opportunity tonight to kind of just go into the story behind, talk about... Um, uh, how Design Smith came to be. Talk about how you kind of came into the pathway of entrepreneurship and starting your own business. And so I just, again, I want to say That's welcome. Right. Thank you. My pleasure. So Thank you for having me. Let's start off with your childhood. That's always a, a good place to a good place to. <laughs> I should to lay down. Start. For that, right? Yeah. <laughs> I need a couch. Um, tell you know, tell tell me a story. Tell me you know, tell us a story. Mm -hmm. uh, something about uh, your childhood. Oh goodness. Um, I had a great childhood. I. Um, I, as far as, um, jeez, got me on that one. Yeah, no, just, um, just, just. I had a great childhood. I have a brother who is three years older than me. Um, we are actually both celebrating a birthday in the next few days. We're a day, we're three years and a day apart. Um, my parents are amazing. They're in the audience, of course. I'm super lucky. I'm very, very fortunate. Um, I grew up in Burnt Hills, and which some of you know is um, a stone's throw from here. Um, and I ended up back here. I, let's see, I left after college, and I ended up back here probably about 10 years later. So I love it here. So you love the area. Yeah. Childhood yeah. was good. Um, yeah. When you know, was there anything when you were growing up that uh, was there anyone that was in a entrepreneurial or a business owner, someone that you saw that kind of made you think, hmm, you know, maybe uh, someone that encouraged you, someone Absolutely. that kind of pushed you? Yeah, those. Um, there are actually two people, and it happened when I was in college. Um, I, have two, I had two amazing professors who were teachers, part-time teachers, but mm -hmm. they also both owned um, full-time graphic design firms. Okay. And it was uh, Fred Troller and Douglas Harp, and they both taught me a ton and really inspired me. And I think that they've got to be the ones who really made me decide that entrepreneurship that mm -hmm. was the way to go. Yep. So let's talk a little bit about the journey. So we had the childhood, and we went away to college. Uh, we went to college. And um, then you, you know, before you were a business owner, you were an employee. So talk a little bit about the, the career path that brought you to Design Smith Studio. Yeah, I, I, um, I'm so glad that I didn't start a business right off the rip. Um, I learned from some of the best, uh, statistically speaking. Uh, Tremayef and Geismar were my, um, my first job. Ivan Tremayef and Tom Geismar um, are gurus in the field. Um, but before, that was my first full-time job right out of college. Before that, I... Uh, had an internship with Vignelli Associates, um, both in, in New York City, Manhattan. And uh, Massimo Vignelli, he just passed away this past May, but um, there's no one greater than that man, in my opinion, as far as graphic design and what he taught. And uh, he developed the um, map for the subway system in New York City, um, Pan Am. He and his wife, Layla, are, um, or he was, um, a designer through and through. They designed uh, furniture and um, silverware and dishes and wine labels and just 
the whole package. I think he was once coined with the saying of, if you can design one thing, you can design anything. And that's exactly what he did. That's pretty awesome. So yeah. it sounds like you had, um, you know, once you went into your career, it sounds like you had great mentors. Absolutely. And we'll talk, about, we'll talk about mentors a little bit later. But you had great mentors in school. Yeah. But then uh, actually, as you began your career, you also had folks that kind of set examples for Absolutely. you, gave you the role oh, modeling. Yeah, is, I didn't get here on my own, that's for darn sure. <laughs> okay, yeah. so um, sometimes a, a business is born to solve a problem. There's a frustration, there's a, you know, I need widgets <laughs> and I can't get widgets. Um, so was Design Smith Studio birthed out of a problem that you wanted to solve or, or would you say that it was more the, the role models that you had or was it both? Um, my mother's in the audience and I'm surprised she's not screaming right now because um, she's been, she has reminded me a number of times that I have since I was probably the age of speaking saying I'll do it myself. So I've always wanted to do it myself. I can do it. I got this. And I think that that's, um, once I had that like that little bug I wanted, that's all I wanted to do. So um, I used these really amazing experiences that I had with these just phenomenal designers to pick their brain, to ask them a ton of questions, to learn from them, and um, all along thinking this is where I want to be down the road. And um, it was just, I was fortunate enough that uh, the time was really, really perfect when I moved back to the area. and. Um, and that's when I decided to start my own business. So it was, I think that it was less of a problem and more of just a complete desire of seeing if I can roll by myself. can do it on your own. Yeah. And I can so relate to the I can do it yourself. <laughs> I, you I mean, can. you said that and I'm kind of like, is my mom uh -huh. here too? Because, uh, yeah, I, I absolutely can relate to that. Um, uh, that kind of a need to, you know, it's, it's an independent spirit. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a, um, for myself, I know sometimes it's a, I can do it better than anyone else kind of a spirit. <laughs> Um, no one can do it as good as I, That's I can. That's a perfectionist right yeah, there. Yeah, so the perfectionist there. So once you started Design Smith Studio, um, I just wanted to ask you, we're going to get to the branding part, but I wanted to talk a little bit um, about just being a small business owner or being a business owner. What would you say were some of the misconceptions that you had? Like, you know, you, mm -hmm. you're like, okay, I want this thing. I want to start this mm -hmm. business. And you start it, and then you're like, ah, okay. Oh, yeah. Um, Ah, you have to bill clients, you have to do the invoicing, you have to do the um, estimating, you've got to write all of that. All that business stuff that, um, the, the I just so want to fun. design, I just want to, you know, educate and inform and right. I just want to do these things and make companies happier and, and have their sales go up and all this, you know, things that I had learned that I felt very confident with and then I, um, and then all of a sudden the, you know, balancing a checkbook and stuff like that, that I did personally, kind of, not right. really. Right. Now I really had to do it. Yeah, so so the some of the mundane things, um, and that almost kind of answers, I was going to say, what, what were some of the things that surprised you? And it sounds like yeah. that might have been uh, as well. What delights you about being uh, the owner of design? You just smiled. Yeah, and you I can't imagine. Something. Every once in a while, um, I was just talking to one of my girlfriends, and we were talking about, wouldn't it be cool to go to a 9 to 5 and leave the work behind when you leave the office and yeah I mean there's a there's a part of me that says oh it'd be really nice not to be married to my job but I love being married to my job I love that um, I love what I do and I I have um, I'm just I'm really passionate about it and I'm passionate that my clients come to me for for me I'm delighted that um, I'm in my 15th year and people are still my phone is still ringing, so I, um, Which is I'm feeling very fortunate. I'm, I'm feeling very fortunate. One of the, um, you know, one of the things that, that separates Startup Brian, I won't tell you, may, it makes, makes us a little bit unique um, from some of the other uh, events that are targeted to entrepreneurs is the story. And, um, you know, what, you know, not just a story of success, right? We assume that if a person is up on a stage mm. that they've yeah. achieved a level of success, which you absolutely have. I mean, you would not be in business. Small businesses are, are you know, most of them are gone within the first five years. Mm. So the fact that you have, you know, done two times that is clearly uh, you are serving a need um, and doing it well because you have, a, you have a book of business. But, you know, there, part of that success comes from lessons learned and from obstacles um, that are overcome. So mm -hmm. talk about that whole obstacle journey. 
Um, one of my obstacles, what would that be? I, I think, um, I think maybe one of the obstacles would be, and this is probably going back a little bit to the business end of it, is that um, you, I, I end up trusting people, and um, and my success rate has been really awesome as far as working with amazing clients. Um, but there's probably been one or two where um, you got to knock on their door an extra few times, and and it's frustrating. It's an obstacle, and um, I mean, there's there's part of me that says, eh, that one didn't work out, and and there's other times where you just want to dig in your heels and say, wait a second, this isn't the way it's supposed to go. Right. But that's you know so the nature life. of mm -hmm. so so dealing with customers. I um, love dealing with customers. Right. That's my favorite part. My, so it's the favorite part and the worst part. Yeah. Right? When, so you're, when the, you do deal with one that's not uh, the two side up front co -op, and honest, cooperative. it's a little difficult. Okay. But it's the nature of, yeah, of, be, of being in business is yeah. what it sounds like. It's been far and few between in the years that I've been in business. I can probably only count two. Right. And one was in my first year of business and, and one more recently. So it's... It's it's very, uh, it doesn't happen very often, thankfully. So going back to the question of your uh, your girlfriend when you're having that conversation, have you ever had an experience that just made you say, you know what, that is it. I'm, I'm giving this up. I'm throwing in the towel. I am going to go back and get that nine to five. Never. That's awesome. That's I really awesome. I just, yeah. I love it. <laughs> so let's talk a little more about um, the actual, uh, the, the making it happen. A lot of startup businesses um, uh, start off at home. They're, home they're either home-based businesses or they're starting in the home in the basement mm -hmm. in a garage. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the typical you know scenario mm -hmm. that you hear a startup starts in the garage. Um, but I know from experience that working from home presents its own unique set of we won't call them challenges. We'll just call them circumstances. <laughs> so um, you have um, you have had that experience as well of working from home, and yes. so. Um, I just wanted you to kind of share, I know we have uh, some students here in the audience, you know, how can you, or, or maybe some other folks too that work from home, you know, how, how can you um, talk about what some of the challenges working from home and then some of the benefits working from home? Um, I see so many benefits. I, and you know, it's interesting because I do re recognize that a lot of startups do this, a lot of startups um, who need um, to begin testing the waters with low or no overhead and so on and so forth. There's some obvious reasons why startups begin in their home. But there are a lot of businesses now who are offering um, the ability to work from home because there is intrinsically so much benefit. And if you really love what you're doing, you're going to be working. So what I found, um, and this could be in part to being a creative, um, and this actually could answer your question, what, it, what has surprised me too. I work a lot. Um, I can't imagine um, being in an office situation at um, 2 a.m. in the morning and then getting in a car and driving home. It's pretty great that I just have one flight of stairs to walk up. So, um, so there are a lot of benefits. It's wonderful that when I need a break and I need to let my creative brain rest, and I'm not interested in doing any of that business work that we talked about, I can um, walk my dog or I can, I can take a little breather. And I know that I can put an extra hour in later if I have to after dinner. Or, you know, there, There's so much flexibility in, in a, and autonomy. Um, the downsides are probably um, what everyone would guess. Um, you've got everything there to um, challenge you in the sense of where your attention goes. Um, my home office is almost the same size as my living space in my house. It's entirely separate. Um, it has a door. It's on a different level. It, um, it's, it was designed by me especially for this. So I can't hear other things that are happening in the house part. And it, there's, I, I mean, I designed it especially so there wouldn't be a lot of those challenges. Um, I have my own bathroom and everything. You know, like I'm not walking back through my house to, you know, I'm not going out of the zone, if you will. So that, it sounds like that is, that is a way that you have minimized. I think something that I hear often um, and experience myself is, is the distraction factor. Yeah, it absolutely. is, you know, it's like, like you say, I leave my working space to go to the, oh my gosh, is that, oh, and there's laundry. the kitchen. Yeah, yeah, squirrel. squirrel. <laughs> yeah, exactly, squirrel, exactly. Yeah. Um, so it sounds like you found a way that that's, so it, it, if a person can find a way to kind of isolate themselves or have a set apart 
yes. uh, place in there if they if they are working from home, and that will give them that kind of mm -hmm. insulated. And some people have that great willpower. And I mean, yeah, some people just do. And I think that there is this whole secondary level of if you've got work to do and you've got a deadline. I mean, because it's not like if you work from home, you don't have a deadline. Sure. You don't have a boss apparently, you know, presumably breathing down your neck, but you're breathing down your neck because sure. you've got a client who's expecting something. There's always a deadline. There's always something that needs to get completed, needs to be accomplished. Sure. So um, if you do your laundry or see those squirrels during the day, then you're going to be up all night long because that deadline isn't going to change. I'm trying to catch those things. Let's, you talked about the creative uh, piece of it, and you know, I wanted to just visit that for a moment. So sometimes I think folks have, and, and some truth to it, that uh, there's the, the, right, the right brain, right? That's the creative mm -hmm. side. Mm -hmm. And then there's that left brain, which is the one that's more analytical and logical and you know, caught up with those, those not mm -hmm. so much, not so fun things. Um, you know, how, how do, you, do you find that you are able to turn them off as you need them? Uh, as a graphic designer, I know you're, you're designing, but you're also doing a lot of writing because you're doing right. copy and things like that as well. Right. So how are you able to make that kind of a, a transition? I would think it, it might be different from someone who perhaps was in an IT business, so it's kind of a right. more linear thought. How have you managed that? Um, I, I think one of the, I, I do feel like there's so much of a blend happening. Um, I minored in English in hopes of being able to complement my design business in that, in that way, to be able to do the copywriting and editing and things like that. Um, however, I have found that um, that analytical left brain, if you will, needs a lot more um, structure because I don't care for that as much. So I find myself uh, at least once a month doing the 9 p.m. to 1 a.m. you know unfortunate time frame where I'm not going to hear my phone ring, I'm not going to get any text messages, I'm not going to be, you know, nothing's happening on Facebook that's going to intrigue me. Don't there are those times because everyone else is sleeping, so I really have to do it, and so I just you set get yourself, it done. You set those times. Yeah. Um, as a uh, an entrepreneur or solopreneur in a, in, a, in a company. You've got segmented. You've got your, you know, your accounting, and you've got your, you know, your legal, and you've got um, the IT department. And when you're, uh, you know, a small business owner, then you are all of those things. You're the right. boss, and you are, you're meeting all of those departments. But at some point, I would imagine, um, pretty much whatever company you have, there is going to be a need for collaboration. So how, so you've got that isolated, um, more solitary role, and then you have a need for collaboration. How, how does one uh, kind of marry and bridge those two? I have an awesome arsenal of freelancers who I work with, uh, illustrators, photographers, copywriters, um, some phenomenal marketing gurus that I can, who I can call on and who, are, um, who have become great friends. So it's, um, it's a great collaboration in that sense. And if I don't have, if I have the workload that's a little bit too heavy or if I have um, questions there's some really phenomenal people who I've been very fortunate to become friendly with over the years. So you said arsenal. So it, it seems like it makes sense to try and have um, those alliances in Absolutely. place to build those. That's going to be important uh, for a person to um, have that resource because you really can't do everything no. on your own. Yep. Um, so not successfully. I, not I, think, <laughs> I, I think there was a time where I was, um, because from my business I'm doing... Um, logos and websites and um, trade show booths and I was I, I still am doing um, interior signage and exterior signage and some architectural it, and it goes on and on and on and there was a time where I was um, as far as the websites were going I was designing the websites and building the websites mm -hmm. but um, the technical end is moving faster than the speed of light and certainly was even sure. more so then and for me to be an awesome technical person, I didn't feel as though I could do it in the same amount of time or stay, you know, mm -hmm. ahead of the game. And I think that's when I said, okay, this is the time I need to hire, have an expert do it, sure. and I'll do the designing, and right. that was a wonderful marriage and that bringing I still the partnerships in. And that, you know, segues us right into, you know, the branding part of our conversation. So, you know, we've talked a little bit, and I think um, it would seem to be that uh, the common perception of what a brand is, it's, it's very different. 
Um, and I think sometimes people think, oh, brand, and they think it's a logo, it's a, you know, um, it's an image, it's a, it's a trademark. Um, but it's really none of that and all of that. And all of that, yeah. So, so, <laughs> so let's just start with the basics of what is a brand. Um, I think uh, there's a, a number of different ways to look at it. I think that, um, let's see, the layman's terms perhaps are um, the cows in the pasture. And they all look exactly the same until one gets branded. Um, no pun intended. And, and then that one looks different. So, and that could be the logo. But what happens is, as you sit and watch these cows in the pasture, they all have different personalities, they have different speeds, they have different ways of moving, and and you as the um, onlooker or consumer in um, in the product that we'd be speaking of um, interprets that differently, or you have a different feeling about that. So the essence of what that cow is or what that brand is is the whole kit and caboodle of how um, how a brand works and how um, how that messaging happens. I so mean, we, we all brand ourselves all the time. Whether we're um, whether I'm looking like this today or I'm in my pigtails and camo tomorrow, you know, like I'm, which is weakening my brand apparently <laughs> if I'm always looking different. But um, it's how people perceive us also. So so. If I understand what you're saying, branding, the, the, one of the reasons, I kind of said what is branding, but you very nicely talked about why branding is important. And I think that's really the more important question um, because it's a, it sounds like it's a way for a company to differentiate themselves from the other. Because there, you know, how many advertising agencies are there? Mm -hmm. How many marketing agencies? How many coffee shops are there? Um, so, you know, branding is a way to allow a particular company to... Uh, differentiate themselves and stand Absolutely. out as you said the brand is when someone sees that and they they mm -hmm. kind of know what that is so um, from a, a client perspective what are some things to consider when you're developing a brand um, well if we could back it up even further if if I had um, if I were having this conversation with someone who was interested in branding we'll talk yeah let's talk about yeah. your process well I, I might um, uh, even different from the process, um, your initial question, I would I would say, if you don't have a product yet, the best thing that you can possibly do is to come up with a product product that hasn't happened yet. Um, Red Bull did that extremely successfully. They were the first highly caffeinated um, um, soft drink, mm -hmm. I guess is what you would call them, mm -hmm. on the market, and they exploded. Mm -hmm. And then after that came uh, Monster and then um, Rockstar. Rockstar. Mm -hmm. And um, and they M Monster and Rockstar still haven't caught up. And part of that is just because the first splash that happened was Red Bull. Mm -hmm. And Red Bull was brilliant enough to have them coupled with an alcoholic beverage. And so their market you know, spans a number of different target audiences as well as um, market shares at this point. So... Mm -hmm. Um, so I would initially say come up with a product that is um, brand new, amazing, and has um, a desire to be met, a, a need mm -hmm. in, in, the, in your market. But um, second to that, if uh, a client came to me and they already had a product, I would say um, be narrow, as, as narrow as you can, because you can't please all the people all the time. Mm -hmm. Um, and your target audience, you gotta, you gotta know yourself. You gotta know your brand, what you, what you intend to do, mm -hmm. and then of course know your um, audience, how they actually perceive you. Um, an example for that um, might be uh, Starbucks. Uh, I forgot his first name, Schultz. Mm -hmm. Amazing um, brilliance in that he was basically the first coffee shop. So mm -hmm. before the, before Starbucks, we were going to um, Dunkin' Donuts or a deli or um, a convenience store, mm -hmm. and all of these places you'd walk in or order from your drive-through, and you'd also see um, soft drinks and juices and hamburgers and sandwiches and different types of cheeses if you're in the deli and mm -hmm. and um, different rolls and all the stuff you're inundated, <clears throat> and all of a sudden right. you've gone there for coffee and you end up leaving with an orange juice and sure. a, you know a donut. Which is really, really great for the for the store, but not so much. Great for, for the store, product. not so much for the product. Sure. So um, Starbucks came out with, oh, we'll have a coffee shop, and we'll do a, a you know high end and 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 this is what we're gonna sell. Mm -hmm. 
And of course, they've opened up a little bit beyond that mm -hmm. in their later years, but they made their amazing splash for that alone. And other businesses are still trying to catch up to them. Mm -hmm. And Starbucks is actually a great example for another part of our conversation, which is you know, what happens when you kind of begin to mix other things up. You do the line extension, uh, mm -hmm. or you begin to, um, oh, you know, this is what I do. I'm a coffee shop. Because like you say, Starbucks was that pristine coffee shop experience. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then when some of the other McDonald's started making mm -hmm. and then Dunkin Donuts and um, Dunkin Donuts was already making coffee but then McDonald's came out with a coffee and other people started to move in on that uh, coffee brand even though they each served a different type of a right. coffee drinker right. but then Starbucks did a switch right uh, and that you know so we we're kind of talking about what happens when a company begins to switch or uh, either bring out a sub type mm -hmm. of a topic or begin mm -hmm. to switch all together. So it, what, what are some things that can happen? Well, um, your, your question that you asked me about um, you know, how this works with working with a client, mm -hmm. and I would say keep your brand mm -hmm. as narrow as possible. Um, the reason is, and I'm gonna use, um, I'm gonna go back to um, Red Bull as an example, mm -hmm. because when Rockstar came out, they were third on the, mm -hmm. um, to the game in that, and he decided, I'm going to do line extension. So what line extension is, is um, opening up your product to offer to many different targets, many different audiences. Mm -hmm. And what that does is weakens your brand. Mm -hmm. So Rockstar came on and said, okay, I'm not just gonna have one flavor and it's not just gonna just be decaffeinated and we're not gonna have it in alcoholic beverage because Red Bull already did that. So they were gonna say, okay, I'm gonna have it coffee flavored and fruit punch flavored and all of a sudden they tried to keep everybody happy and and they're, they don't have a strong, um, mm -hmm. concentrated market any longer. Mm -hmm. and, th and that's happened a number of times to a number of different companies. And sometimes it works. There's mm -hmm. always the exception, of course. But a lot of times um, it weakens their brand enough that they really lose their brand loyalty. Mm -hmm. Give an example. Let's talk about brand loyalty and give an example of a company that might um, have done that. Brand loyalty is um, when someone purchases from a company because of the brand, uh, regardless of perhaps what the product is. Um, BMW, BMW is great, I love BMW, but there's a lot of um, people who buy because it's BMW, not necessarily because that style is beautiful, it's because it's um, considered the driving machine. Mm -hmm. um, Volvo has, um, and this gets into why taglines are great too, mm -hmm. there's a, a, a um, a word that has been reserved for these businesses that stands true and, and very strong. Volvo, they buy because it's safe. Mm -hmm. So their brand loyalty is not necessarily because the car is pretty or they mm -hmm. they like that it, you know, the style necessarily. It's because... Um, it's a, it creates a, an impression, a mindset absolutely. Mm -hmm. for the, for the uh, consumer. Right. And that's the reason that they, they go forth. Um, so, talk, you know, talk, you mentioned taglines and, and why... Yeah. Um, you know why that's important. Uh, why why you want to have a tagline that really matches very well with your what is it you're offering? Um, absolutely. A lot of times, um, unfortunately, we use a tagline as a crutch. Um, we have a, a a brand or a company name that isn't really um, it doesn't tell the story. So you need something else. So if you only have your company name, you need to say, okay, this is what we do. Um, that's not the best case scenario. What would be an um, example of that? Oh, goodness. Um, uh, if a company, and I, I would rather not use names in this yep. because it's a, okay. a company that I just did, but um, okay. if the name is generic, mm -hmm. um, you need to say, um, I'll, I'll make one up. If, if, uh, if the name is... Um, General, best general. Um, we have no idea what, what that means. What does that mean? Yeah, what it could be best paper mean? products. It could be best electric. It could be whatever best sure, means anyway sure, in your in your sure. competitive market. So then your tagline needs to be, um, you know, people making um, soda bottles or you know, like that's right. Horrendous right. No, I understand. Example, what you're saying. but um, it needs you need to be able to tell them, and then so that so the onlooker says, oh, okay, that's what who I'm going to work with if I want to make soda bottles. Okay. So um, tagline is basically the, um, it, it gives us a, an impression more than um, the name might. So 
the energy to make a difference. People may remember that's mobile oil. Um, just do it. Everybody knows that. And in fact, the Nike brand is so amazing that no longer do we need the N-I-K-E. Uh, we just need that swoosh. Or we need just do it. I mean, their tagline right. has um, almost taken over their, their company um, logo at this point, which mm -hmm. is phenomenal marketing and branding. And if we all had that um, budget, that would be quite something. Well, we, we talked about um, how it can be detrimental or weaken a brand if a company goes into sub-markets or really tries to meet everyone's need, try to make everyone's happy. <laughs> when can a company, when does a company know when it's time, sometimes they decide it's time for a pivot right. uh, or, or a, re, a rename, uh, Price Chopper uh, mm -hmm. is, is in the process of doing that now. So what are some of the considerations a company might have to say, um, you know, I think we're going to, because that's a pretty huge change for a company. Absolutely. There's a few reasons. Um, one may be because uh, the times are changing and they need to change not only their product, um, but they need to change their, their messaging behind it. Um, but the line extension, which may be your question, um, why would someone open up their brand to other avenues? Um, Donna Karen is well known for her uh, fashion line. Mm -hmm. And it um, was very high end and only hit a certain segment of the, her or their target audience. Mm -hmm. So they um, made a more casual line, DKNY. Mm -hmm. So they wanted to hit um, uh, two or more different consumers. Mm -hmm. um, Waterford Crystal did the same thing with starting Marquee. Cadillac did it with starting a smaller um, sedan, mm -hmm. uh, the Katera. So these are the types of um, businesses that thought, okay, we're, we really have corn on the market right now, but we really want to open this up. Sometimes it weakens it, and sometimes it just extends their great name and increases their So it's something power. that a, uh, a company really, it's not, it's not a flighty, uh, decision. This is something Never. that you really, I would imagine, have to do a lot of research Absolutely. Uh, just to kind of see what's going to happen so that you don't get that, that flop effect. Right. Um, again, talking about brands, um, the importance of a name. Mm -hmm. uh, talk about the importance of a name of a brand or the name of a company. A name is extremely important. It, um, it carries, I mean, all of this is their marketing and their PR and all of this is so heavy into why we remember something, why something's um, memorable, why, why it stays in our brain, what the story is behind it, all of this is all what brand is. But as far as a name, um, I mean, th there's a number of different re ways how you can make mistakes in, in your branding, but um, the two to come to mind, one is generic naming. Um, so um, you don't want to, and there's, and there's um, there's always the companies who prove this wrong, but statistically speaking, you don't want to have anything called general or, or you don't want anything generic. So um, you can go into any one of your drugstores and see nature's miracle, nature's best, nature's way, nature, 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 and the same thing in your grocery stores and so on and so forth. So basically, all of those blend together, and now you don't know who you're, what you're talking about anymore. Um, uh, the same way, with, generically speaking, um, you don't want to say general foods, general, and now, of course, now I'm talking about the exceptions to the rule, G, um, general motors, mm -hmm. general electric, which is the secondary reason that I was going to say, actually, is you don't want to do um, um, initials, because people don't retain that. Mm -hmm. um, it's just not something that stays in their brain um, for very long, statistically speaking. And then, of course, you have the exceptions, which is GE, GF, GM, uh, IBM. So there are, and, and, you, and you always have to consider the exceptions, why they did work. Is mm -hmm. it their marketing? Is it their product? Is mm -hmm. it the quality? Is it their you know, publicity that they got behind it? So it's not, just, right. it's not just one thing most times when you're talking about branding. But if I were to <coughs> suggest to someone mm -hmm. who was starting naming, I wouldn't be mm -hmm. anything generic, and I wouldn't do initials. Okay. But there are, uh, as we're talking about the names and the importance of names, there are some names of companies that it begins, to, it's, it's, we know that that's, we hear the name and we know what, the, it stands for the, the whole product. Right. You know, like a Kleenex, you know, mm -hmm. um, you ask for, for those sort of things. How, I mean, how, how, you don't, I'm sure when they came up with those names, they had no idea. 
that they would come to be, but perhaps that goes back to what you were saying earlier, is try to be the first of a thing. Absolutely. I don't know if Kleenex was the first paper tissue, but now when Absolutely. I need to sneeze, I'm going to say, please pass me a Kleenex. Mm -hmm. you know. um, I think some of these, um, you, I didn't, I wouldn't have thought um, were the, the first on the scene. Rollerblade was the first on the scene for an inline skate. Who knew? Because rollerblade, are, they're rollerblades. Saran wrap. It's saran wrap. Regardless of what brand it is, it's still saran wrap to me. Mm -hmm. um, Band-Aid, you said Kleenex. There's so many like that. Jello. I mean, Jello is, um, I think it's called gelatin or something that's mm -hmm. not Jello brand. So it's, um, there are things that we don't even think about that that brand that took off so much that it, the product has become the brand name. That it stands for what the brand uh, itself. Um, do you have a, fa a favorite brand? Do you? Um, I have a lot of favorite brands, but um, the first one that comes to mind um, would be Mobile. And I think that's probably because, um, this is shameless, but um, that was my first award that I got in New York City for doing um, the Energy to Make a Difference, which I mentioned earlier. That was earlier. a reason to have yeah. <laughs> for them so to that's be a my, favorite. I think sure. that's where I gained a lot of my confidence, too. But mobile is um, amazing. In fact, um, so, so I worked with mobile um, when I was working with Chamayaf and Geismar right out of school. And... Um, and I learned a lot about them then. Uh, some people may remember the Pegasus. Years and years ago, mm -hmm. that, that Pegasus was there. If you see back when um, Mobile was first designed, they still had the red O, mm -hmm. but it was different shapes. The, the fonts, the typography was different. Mm -hmm. It has changed, and this is really why I love it so much, that, that logo. It has changed so brilliantly over the years. And... Um, with such amazing thought mm -hmm. and care mm -hmm. that <clears throat> most people wouldn't know that there were changes that happened with that logo. It stayed innovative. It stayed uh, to you know to the time mm -hmm. and on the cusp of everything. Right. And when the Pegasus wasn't working anymore, they just slowly pulled it out, right. and and people didn't even ever. That's one of the brands that people didn't say, wait, 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 why are you changing this? Right. Because right. people do have a hard time when you make that big change, right. and they really loved it. I mean, people sure. become married to their brand and, and, what, and it to looks, what it looks like. What it looks like, even though the product <laughs> itself may not change Absolutely. at all. There again, that speaks to that brand loyalty and that in that attachment. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So, if we are um, talking to, I know, like again, I know we have students, uh, or even someone that's just considering graphic design or any type of a business. Um, there's this uh, sort of view that when you're starting a, a startup, uh, you go to school, like a lot of schools now are offering, which they didn't used to offer, business courses, uh, not business courses, but entrepreneur, courses on entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. I know Sienna has a strong, uh, one of the schools right. that has a strong program. And then you have other purists that are, you know, many successful companies that we read about that their founders didn't even finish high school. Um, so, um, you know, you went to college and you have a business. So as you're looking back, were there things that you wished uh, for those who choose to take the college route, were there courses that you kind of either wished you'd taken uh, that you think would be helpful now, or what recommendations would you make for folks that are yeah. considering? You nailed it. I um, I knew from um, I can for as long as I can remember that I wanted to be in the art field. Um, I knew that I wanted to um, make money. I knew that I didn't want to be though I really want to still be in that log cabin in the middle of the woods, I didn't want to be a potter trying to sell my work and, and have that stress of if I wasn't the number one potter, I wasn't going to make money. Um, so I knew that that's what I wanted to do. Taking the graphic design classes and, and all the art classes was easy. Um, I took a ton of psychology classes because I knew that dealing with people, this was a really, it, it was of interest to me anyway, but, but I knew that that would help me. Um, my English, of course, my English minor, and then I took a ton of photography classes because I thought this would be really helpful in my business. Um, what I didn't think of and what I um, wish that I knew or someone um, pushed me in that direction was the business classes. And of course, we didn't have the entrepreneurial classes back in the day, but, right. um, but the business is something that I learned along the way mm -hmm. from experience and from learning from people. But um, 
I, let's see, when I lived in Boston, I taught at the Massachusetts College of Art. And then um, when I moved back <coughs> here uh, 15 years ago, I started teaching at the College of St. Rose. Mm -hmm. And um, I just, ironically enough, was um, in the classroom a couple weeks ago. And I sat with the students, three hour class, sat with the students for two hours during one class where we were supposed to be doing our critiques. And it's senior class, and we just chatted. And the questions that they ask are so awesome. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of, you reminded me of, of that and how, I mean, they're brilliant. They know so much. I feel like mm -hmm. I learned much more than they probably did in those two hours. But what I did tell them a lot of is um, be confident. You know, art and our opinion is so important. And, um, but, it, but it is a, um, it is an opinionated, mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. field and you do get people who don't agree this you know constructive criticism sometimes is just criticism mm -hmm. and if you believe in who you are and where you've come from it's it's huge and to um, you know we were talking about um, the silly stuff that they thought that they found um, valuable like to be honest to mm -hmm. be trustworthy to mm -hmm. um, have that good handshake to stand up and to um, to own what you really know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and and to not back down from that. <laughs> right. On the flip side, ask a ton of questions. Work your tail off. Mm -hmm. Stay those extra hours. I remember plenty of times when I was working with Massimo Vignelli, of course, how, how I've described as my guru, my huge mentor. Um, I would I, that was between my uh, junior and senior year of college, mm -hmm. and it just so happened every Friday night, about 45 minutes before Amtrak was going to bring me back up here. Um, Massimo would come around the corner in my, you know, little cubby and say, Christian, you know, he's Italian. I was thinking maybe you and I could work on this tonight. And, you know, what goes through my brain is, oh my God, no, I'm going home. You know, right. like my dog's waiting for me and my parents have dinner on the table. You know, right. I got to go. And every single time I was like, absolutely. Because that's, that's when you learn. That's when the magic starts to happen that mm -hmm. this person who's so amazing and so renowned mm -hmm. sits down with you. Right. And says, let's figure this out together. So yeah. take advantage of those little tiny nuggets that you think are annoying, where you sit back years later and say, oh, so right. glad I know that. So that comes to the mentor question. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I don't have to, I was going to say, you know, what do you think about the idea of mentors? And clearly, uh, in, your, in your career, especially your experience, they have been, um, how, you know, you happen to get those through the, the, the jobs that you had. How would you suggest that uh, if someone is a, it doesn't even have to be a student, because mentorships are, Apprenticeships uh, can be acquired. Mm -hmm. How would someone call. go about? Just pick up the phone and call. It. So a yep. company that you're interested in, or that's in Absolutely. the field that you're interested yeah, in. Yeah, and and I think it's a different from my experience, which it's you know it's different for everyone, of course. But mm -hmm. um, I was living in New York City. I I went to school at Alfred University, Western New York, and went straight to New York City after after school. Mm -hmm. And um, I was there for almost five years, I guess. When I moved to Boston from there, mm -hmm. I knew I wanted to teach, but I didn't. Ha I don't have my master's. Mm -hmm. I didn't know anything about it. But I knew that I really. I come from a family of, of um, educators, and I just had that. And it probably goes back to my two professors in college that I I wanted to see if I mm -hmm. was cut out for that. So I called the um, director of the art department at the Massachusetts College of Art, and I said, "Hello, la la la. Mm -hmm. This is who I am. This is what I've been doing, and I'm moving to the area, and I just." was wondering if I could pick your brain because I have some questions and it's just of great interest to me. Mm -hmm. Would you have 20 minutes to sit down with me if I came to your office? And um, I'll never forget that woman. She was phenomenal. She said, absolutely, when would you like to come? Because mm -hmm. I, I asked for 20 minutes. I didn't say, can you meet me someplace? I came mm -hmm. to her mm -hmm. and we sat down. That was a two and a half hour interview mm -hmm. and I left with a job. Mm -hmm. So. I mean, it just so happened, apparently they must have been looking and right. it was a great fit and I got super fortunate and lucky mm -hmm. and the stars were all aligned and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. But um, I just called and said, right. and I would have been psyched if she said, I really don't have 20 minutes, but I've had five now. Sure. Would you like to talk? Right. And next time perhaps she'd remember my name if something mm -hmm. came up. Stuff like that. It's just getting connections. Sure. Go to your, you know, be a part of your chamber. Go to those events. Mm -hmm. Go to events like this with the networking and take advantage of the networking. So really um, kind of looking, take courses, uh, strengthen yourself in areas that you may not be strong, 
uh, the yucky things, the things bullet. that make you yeah bite the bullet. Those <laughs> things that what makes you, you don't want to think about. Seek out mentors. Mm -hmm. um, join uh, perhaps associations or groups that have that interest. Uh, you know, photography or mm -hmm. the things that you want to uh, bone up on. Look for mentors. Just ask because people want to be. They want to be helpful. People love. Uh, and if you're respectful. To be... And um, the, always remember the law of little goes to big. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's always like you say. You're not expecting them uh, to come to you or do anything. Um, uh, for you, but you are really, um, I think it's very flattering to be asked uh, for your, um, so, so folks can, um, can definitely get some, uh, some help and some information that way as well. So I wanted to leave time for the audience to ask some questions, um, but the last thing I wanted to, to ask you about was um, community engagement. A lot of the, you know, at this point I've done, uh, we're in December, so I guess I've done, it's been 12, 12 uh, entrepreneurs. Thank you exactly. that I've, I've had the opportunity to, uh, the, the privilege, I should say, to speak to, um, and community engagement at some level comes up, um, you know, depending on uh, the particulars. I know there are some companies that actually have that built in. There's a department mm -hmm. that handles that, but I know that you mm -hmm. also, community engagement is really important to you, yes. and is that part of the, uh, the, the entrepreneurial small business mindset or, or I wouldn't say mindset but just kind of the, the personality characteristic um, well for me I think um, being a part of something has always been really important to me mm -hmm. um, whether it be a family or friendships or mm -hmm. or your community and it perhaps I, I, when I was working for larger companies mm -hmm. um, I loved the water cooler conversation. I mean, right. I loved coming in in the morning and, you know, what you have for dinner and all that kind of camaraderie that I don't get. You mm -hmm. know, my dogs don't talk. Sure. So, sure. Um, so I I really like that kind of um, mm -hmm. connection, and um, I think that's probably why I started looking into the community, mm -hmm. how I can help out, how I can give back. Mm -hmm. um, I'm on a number of different um, boards. And I just feel I, um, I mean, I'm not saving lives with graphic design. I'm perhaps um, making companies more productive or more lucrative, or right. um, educating or informing or entertaining, perhaps right. with the graphic design right. that I do, right. which is all extremely important. Right. Um, but I wanted to do something that, at the end of the day, made me feel like I was raising something bigger. I was a part of something greater mm -hmm. than just me. And um, I mean, I'm on the board of directors for the domestic violence rape crisis at mm -hmm. uh, Wellspring. We just renamed, and um, Saratoga Arts Fest. So I've got my art background there, mm -hmm. and Saratoga Arts Arts, which used to be the Arts Council, and now the Chamber. And I, I'm I love it. I love mm -hmm. being involved like that. And um, as a result, uh, I think it. Um, I think people feel more confident asking questions and and hiring too I mean I've got right. a lot of my connections through those right. through those areas as well so it's definitely a, another way to not just um, you know it, it feeds you and Absolutely. it also if you say I, I that's a recurring theme that I hear from entrepreneurs that uh, desire to give back that wanting mm -hmm. to give back and it you know I just I think it's it creates kind of a reciprocal sort of uh, I have a theory that I'm, I'm, I'm kind of building here uh, over this past year where really if you picture a ball and there's an X on the top of the ball. And so you're on top of the ball and you're moving forward and you're doing and you're giving, right? And so you're sowing those seeds, but the ball's always moving. And even in those times when it doesn't feel like there's a whole lot happening or you may not be having, uh, maybe in, in a dry period, but it's still rolling. Oh, and yeah. so it's going to come to that point where uh, you begin to receive um, kind of the harvest yeah. of those things. And it sounds like that's what I'm hearing uh, as well from you. You're giving into these um, and it's it's reciprocating whether it's uh, just a sense of fulfillment or mm -hmm. giving back and or, it's connections and it's a connection as well and it's if it, it's uh, so many of my friendships are now um, born out of um, meeting them in the capacity of right. working in our community and giving back that way. What's next for you? What, I mean, what would what would you what would you say would be the next step that you'd like to see happen? Um, I want to keep doing what I'm doing. I love it. Um, I am always ready for the next um, idea or invention or excitement. I um, I have my I have my heart set on a few new things that I'm mm -hmm. hoping to come to fruition. We'll see if that actually yeah. happens. But um, 
I'm always, in addition to that, I'm always um, prepared to collaborate. Mm-hmm. Um, I want to be a part of the innovation and excitement of newness and um, bright ideas. It's, um, I think there's a lot out there that we haven't tapped into. Mm-hmm. And whether it be with graphic design or branding or sure. Um, sure. something greater for the community, sometimes too is what I have my heart set on. Okay, well, that sounds great. Um, and like I said, I wanted to leave some time for the audience to ask some questions. So we are at that time now. And so. You guys are still here? <laughs> Hi! <laughs> Thank you for seeing Two seeing. questions. Um, this goes back to the beginning of your discussion, but uh, I think it's Howard Schultz from Starbucks. Is it? Oh, is, um, uh, in some of his, in some of his, what you call it, uh, he's selling wine, and I guess he's also going to get into the business of selling very upscale coffees, mm-hmm. dessert, they're called reserves. You can order buy one or buy, you know, buy a reserve drink at. Uh, Start at the uh, Stuyvesant Plaza. Um, so one question is, what would you say to Howard? Is he making a big, big mistake? I would say, um, Howard, thank you so much for calling me. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <Too much. laughs> exactly. I love exactly. coffee. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but you know, moving into so, wine, like the wife heard that. Uh, yeah, yeah. It, because you, um, because he's coffee. He's the coffee guy. Yeah. So why is he gonna dabble in wine where he's not? On a vineyard and all. Um, well, I have to taste the wine. Um, no, so I really like it. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, that's where I need to talk to him. Um, I, I guess I would be I would be fearful that he would this line extension that we talk mm-hmm. of um, would weaken everything, and he would end up um, with uh, a, a weak wine that people wouldn't really take him seriously mm-hmm. for this conversation yeah. alone, how we're kind of generally speaking of it. Um, a lot of times the best thing to do if you want to go into a different market, if you want to start a different product, is um, leave your Starbucks coffee as beautiful and as as brilliant as he has done it, and then start a brand new company, a brand new name, a brand new logo brand, et cetera, et cetera, marketing system on the side. And develop it the way that you can. That's what he's doing in part with this reserve coffee. Which is opening reserve coffee shops that are going to be that aren't going to carry the traditional Starbucks line. They're going to hmm. carry this. It sounds very similar to coffee. It sounds like reserve coffee, which perhaps. Yeah, well, what it is apparently there are places that you know in, in the various countries that grow coffee. Right. There are places that grow very select. And very limited, and only so many bags of coffee per mm-hmm. year. Um, so that sounds so like something that be, instead of you know two dollars for a tall, it will be four or six dollars. Okay. And these, these are the you know the creme de la creme mm-hmm. of, of coffee. I had one. Oh really? <laughs> oh, see, that's not so good so far. But yeah. I would say that that a reserve coffee bring it right into your Starbucks. But apparently, the already... other shops, I guess, in in Seattle. That have opened just to sell reserve coffee. Hmm. So he's getting competition from that. Well, he's and getting competition from himself. So right. on one corner you could have a Starbucks, and on the next yeah. corner you could have a reserve. So yeah. Um, yeah, it doesn't. The way that I'm understanding it doesn't sound like it's great marketing, but I would hate to say that because he's done a really great job so far. Well, he's lived for a while and came sure. back. Sure. Very strong. Sure. The other question is this is totally different. Um, what do you think of Peck Valley? Oh, I think Pick Up Valley is great. I think that. Um, Why do you think the brand is a good brand? Oh, the brand? Yeah, as a brand for this region. Um, well, you're asking a graphic designer, so I always feel like I could put my mm-hmm. um, two cents in that would make it a little bit um, stronger, you know, different, mm-hmm. something different. But um, what Tech Valley is doing in general, I think, is brilliant and involving a l- bringing our community together um, with a. With a mission, a unified mission, I think is brilliant. I love it. I'm going to go to the back and then I'm going to come to you, Antonio. Erin. Hi there. Um, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about branding for services um, versus product, and maybe also about, a little bit about your experience. You have a lot of 
a lot of experience in the industry or field and then switching over to becoming an entrepreneur or as a consultant or delivering services yourself? How do you brand yourself? Um, let me understand your question. Let me, sure. Um, are you asking me first, are you asking me um, the difference between creating a brand for a product as opposed to a service? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so that's question one. Okay. I think. But then as the service provider, if it's really based on the experience of the people that's giving the service, like in a consulting. Um, Let me answer your first question, because sure. I have questions for your second question. Sure. Um, it is, um, they are different but the same in the sense of the first thing that I do with um, someone who's selling or a company who's selling a product or a service is learn all about them. I want to know, um, I want to know why they started, what, what they want to do, uh, who they are marketing to, um, what they want their market, how they want um, to be viewed by the, mar by the market, what is the essence of them. Um, we'll go through the R&D um, right through to um, uh, discovery. Sometimes um, a client will come to me and stop me if I'm not answering your question, but sometimes a client will come to me and say, I need a new logo. And um, though I'm always extremely anxious to design a new logo, sometimes I say, you know what, actually this isn't so bad. It's your point of purchase. Your POP is not, you know, fitting the bill right now. Or your packaging is, is um, completely um, gone awry from your, from your brand and from what your, um, your mission is. So um, sometimes it's really just in the R&D stage where you are able to kind of um, direct them. But really the difference between service and product is very similar um, in the same sense of um, service. I just did a logo for a service um, in Saratoga Springs and it becomes a little bit more of a feeling. You want to brand a little bit more of what they do, which is so often um, um, services deal with people or, or you know, like, it deals differently than just this one specific thing. A service is normally a lot more broad. Um, but the actual um, start to finish is very similar. And can you tell me your second question? Because I didn't get it the second time. I think the second is maybe more about your personal experience. If you've had a lot of experience in an industry, then how do you yourself when you become a Oh, I'm glad you asked that because I am why they came up with that phrase or whatever it is, the cobbler's children has no shoes. That's totally me. My website, give me a minute because it's under development and um, it's it's an on, I mean, I just, thankfully, and I'm, I feel privileged that I've been as busy as I have been that um, I haven't and taking care of my own business, but that type of thing is um, extremely important. And I, I, I preach it, I, I live this, I eat, sleep, and breathe this all the time. Um, but I don't actually perform that very well in my own business. Not, I know, but, um, um, and I keep saying, darn it, when I actually am doing this, then I've lost some clients, or someone's not calling me, or, you know, like, it's gonna be a bad sign if I have all this time. But, um, or maybe it'll be a great sign because I have more people working with me and we've got our marketing department who's actually taking care of the marketing that, that we pledged to, to see so important. Um, I think that a lot of my, um, my PR, my business has been, um, has been successful because of word of mouth. And, um, you know, if there's credibility and quality you keep going, um, and if people keep talking about it, I, the business keeps coming in. Um, I really don't do a lot of PR. I really don't do PR. I do it for other people, for other companies. Um, I do, um, I mean, even my social networking, which is so incredibly important, um, it's not um, what I deal with as much with my business. So, um, so they're all full-time jobs. They all, they're all, they're, um, and this is one of the things that why graphic design um, in general and marketing always seems to be much more expensive than you would imagine, because there are so many hours behind it. There's so much R&D. There's so much discovery that pulls into why we're doing this that 
Um, this is, they're all full-time jobs on their own. Did I answer that? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Just hold on just one minute. We're going to go up, up front. So feel free to elaborate on any of this. But um, when you're building your brand for like the first time, uh, would you advise creating a brand new booklet you know, with fonts that you're going to use, colors, logos, taglines, um, that will help guide your brand for the future so you can hand it to any of the employees, hand it to anyone, and they'll know exactly what your company's about? And then um, as far as graphic design and brand new mm -hmm. books, and then what would you say are the most important things that when building a brand new booklet or some other media uh, medium as such uh, is important to have in there? Um, I have done, so I call these standards manuals. Um, I have done a number of those uh, types of books. Everyone calls them something differently. Um, the first one I ever did was for the San Francisco Ballet. And I wrote the copy and I did the design. So as I was, the beauty in that was that I was actually designing the products that were in there. So um, I was doing the banners and the stationery and their t-shirts and all this other tchotchke stuff for them. Um, I think it's incredibly important if people use them. So this is just the problem that happens with standards manuals. They can be distributed all day long. Um, but they need to be paid attention to. There needs to be some um, sort of metric that happens. There needs to be some checks and balances that um, nothing goes through the door unless all of these things are really accounted for. Uh, I, I feel very strongly that standards manuals, standard manuals are extremely important. A lot of them now are going online so they can be distributed um, more easily. I also did mobile oils and uh, I did it in seven different languages, actually. So they, mobile feels that this is extremely important. Uh, and they have a very strict way of making sure that their employees follow all of this. Typically, if you have your marketing department who are married into the system, you're pretty good. Because nothing should really pass through your marketing department visually um, without being seen for that. Uh, what was your other question? Uh, just what are the most important things to make sure to have in the you know, standard menu, like staples? Um, the do's and don'ts for color. Um, what you can and can't put backgrounds. So often um, a logo will be um, put on a black background and you miss so much of it. Uh, so what happens in standards manuals that are that are most important is a lot of times you're redesigning things. So the logo, um, um, what's a good example? So um, McDonald's. So that yellow. You can't put that on orange. You can't put that on, and, and then it goes further and further. You don't want that on purple. They have their standards that you can't go past those. Um, your fonts. You can only use some fonts around those with that logo because otherwise you'd have everything. I mean, you can see everything that can, that can actually go awry. Um, and then there's spacing that goes around your logo. You you've got you can't have it to get too crowded, and all of these have measurements that you can build into. So these are the things that happen. So the San Francisco Ballet, um, the logo, um, the bottom has uh, the word ballet, and then San Francisco, San Francisco goes, goes up the side. The way that I built that for their standards manual is that this axis um, in this empty space. You can have um, a dancer. You can have, um, a, for their global uh, networking portion, you can have a globe. Um, you can have a whole bunch of things in here. But there's only 15 that you can really put in there. You can't put anything in there. And then um, the ballet, they have these, this word ballet. The B I put on the side. And you can't go anywhere closer than that B around. So you can't ever put copy. Um, or another title or anything like that around it. I know I'm probably getting too detailed. But that is something that obviously this B grows proportionately. And so that's one of the ways that you can start to build this. So it's not just saying this is what I want you to do and keep doing it. It's actually building the rules and um, the regulations around it that make sense. Any questions? I have a question um, kind of also along the, the lines of stakeholder buying. You mentioned that oftentimes these types of branding projects are much more expensive than 
companies might realize going into it. And so I'm curious to know if you've ever found yourself having to um, help a prospect appreciate the, the value of a brand. It's, it's, it's such an intangible thing. Is there a way that you can help them, you know, particularly someone who's more analytical or more uh, you know, numbers oriented who needs something a little bit more tangible? That was very eloquently asked. I help them often. Um, yes, and it's just it's um, it's an education because of course this is not something that that they have ever done before, presumably. And um, why should they know this? Um, so when someone calls and says, "Hi, I just want a logo. How much is that?" Well, it's not that easy. Number one, and um, and sometimes when I tell them the answer, and they you can kind of hear them having a heart attack. It's because that. They don't understand all the hours that go into it. It's not just uh, making a pretty picture and giving them three examples. Um, if I'm going to give them three examples, which normally I, I give five to eight, eight to twelve sometimes, um, if I can get eight options, that means I've probably done 150 sketches, and then I've put probably 20 of those into the computer, and then I've worked really hard on 10 of those. So, you know, like it's it's a very long process. And before this, I get to my drawing board, if you will, um, I'm researching the comp their competitors. I'm researching their history. Um, I'm Googling as much as I can about their company. Um, it's, uh, and, and then it gets really detailed into color. I mean, color is huge. Um, why would um, McDonald's and Burger King use yellow and red. It's because that reminds us of food subconsciously. So it's all of these things that go into building a logo that um, are not just whimsical. You know, um, it's not three hours of time. It's a ton of time. So it's just going back to the process. And yeah, okay. it really is just. And and I don't use the word education because it seems like you don't know yet. But it's really just letting them know the process and um, and the time, and and a lot of that doesn't even um, involve the time of just your thought process and your you know the creative side of how can I make this logo um, be multifaceted. I designed a um, a logo for a pharmaceutical company, and they were all about the uh, personal touch that when someone would call this pharmaceutical company, you would never get an answering machine. You'd always get a human being, and um, and then it got because of the meds, it got into this um, kind of a whole peace um, centered feel that they were, thought was really important. Uh, so the logo has um, five, four doves that come in at different angles. You can tell very clearly that they're doves, and that's what you see. And then when you look back a second time, hopefully you'll see that there's a mortar and pestle that are formed by the negative space of those doves coming together. Mm -hmm. So the secondary thought is, oh, okay, it's a pharmaceutical company with more than a pestle. Um, that type of thing um, you know, takes a lot more time yeah, than you would sure. imagine just to, you know. So, and you, you pay for what you, you get, what you pay for. I, I've, I've seen that four billion times over mm -hmm. where a company says, ah, I totally get it, but I just don't have the budget. And then um, when they do, they'll come back and say, "We got this logo for you know X amount of dollars, and but now we can now we can move you know past that, okay. which isn't really great for branding when you change your logo so many times." So. <laughs> What's your thought about branding a person with with a company? You know, who they uh, Um, there are major pros and cons to that, obviously, like everything. Uh, my initial thought is that I don't believe in it. I don't think Design Smith Studio has always been Design Smith Studio, whether I own it or whether I sell it to, you know, whomever. That will go on forever as long as as, as it's successful like that. Um, there's a company who I have worked with that they're <laughs> Their um, company is, are their initials, which of course is one of the statistic, statistically speaking, no nos. Um, but those initials were born out of what was initially three names of the three owners mm -hmm. from like 50 years ago or more. And then as those owners either passed away or um, moved out of the business, what are they going to do with this name now that was their brand? And this person isn't even, and in, in one of these cases, 
it was a very poor um, ending that they had. So they didn't want that name on there anymore. But you can't just all of a sudden get up and change your name if you've got a strong product and a strong following. So I say no. Um, I don't know, maybe if you were Obama, yeah, I'd go with it, but not many of us are, so I, I, don't, think it's, I don't think it's a good thing to, to start with. Speak a little louder. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm a senior uh, in college right now, and coming from you know this position of you know starting to build resumes, cover letters, and all that, it's kind of personal branding that we touched on that we touched on earlier in the interview, and um, I just wanted to kind of revisit that um, and ask your advice in terms of you know being in this position where I am right now. I've seen many examples of you know these kind of standardized uh, forms of resumes, cover letters, elements of personal branding that are so important when looking for a first job or any job really, uh -huh. uh, for future. And it's becoming um, more prevalent now, you know, with an artistic background mm -hmm. to kind of uh, show that in a different way. How would you um, kind of approach that side of showing your interest in creativity and, and being a uh, that's a great question. I think that there is a really wonderful, beautiful way to tactfully show your creative side without that becoming your portfolio. Um, I, I think that your portfolio as it is will speak for itself, and your credentials as this resume will be will speak for itself. And when I get resumes, I want it to be extremely clear, extremely concise. up that you, you know, the Swiss design is actually happening there, and um, that is where I say, oh, this person actually could do uh, a consecutive page spread in brochures and know what they're talking about. I don't necessarily need to see your logo, because what if I don't like it? You know, if I don't like that design that you've pulled, is um, you're just, in my opinion, you're uh, starting yourself out on a bad note. If it is well written, are great. That's all it really needs to be. Resumes, in my opinion, have really gone crazy, and I get some of these resumes that I'm like, I don't even know where to start. I still don't even know what the person's name is. <laughs> so, and it, and with it, with the time, I mean, everything's digital too. I mean, I, I get, um, you know, CDs in the mail that they're now I got to put this thing in my computer, which now my computer doesn't even have a CD drive anymore. So I get those. I'm like, I, I don't even know what this is on here, and so. Sometimes the old school really does still work. And probably you are sending a resume to someone who is older than me, so I can say they're a little bit more old school than me. So we really like just to read it on paper. And, an, and a thank you note written, perfect. Emails are fine. If you've got to thank somebody, it's great. But that's one of the things, too, that is a pet peeve of mine. Like it's really When I get a letter, a thank you letter from someone who I gave them my time and energy, I think, oh, that person's really... Like that's classy. So what are some of the resources or websites, books, publications, mm -hmm. anything that you would suggest personally uh, to us that would help us with the, uh, help educate us in branding uh, in any sort? Uh, two of my major mentors as far as branding go are um, the Reese's, the father and daughter team. Al and Laura, I think are their first names. Um, they have written and rewritten book after book. Um, their books that they started years ago, they have since made um, adaptations to for website branding, which has been really cool. Um, but they have a business where um, that's pr primarily their main focus. You can see them online. You can find them any place. Uh, the I mean, I would go back to when I want to learn more about um, a certain aspect of graphic design or branding. I'd go back to the the major gurus, the you know Paul Rand and Massimo Vignelli and um, Milton Glaser and 
I mean, these, these names that are just uh, untouchables. Anybody else have any questions? I would like to, um, just before we close, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to task the audience with questions. I'm going to give you guys homework. Uh, but before I do that, I wanted to give my thanks to uh, Over It Always. Over It uh, does a, an amazing job. Paul Hook and Dan Dismore um, just really do a fantastic job for us every single month. So thank you. Uh, thank you for that. Um, uh, the food, if you guys like the food, those of you who partook of the food, uh, is Raganese uh, Deli, which is just right up the street. <laughs> and my amazing videographers who are Limitless Impress, uh, Imprints, and uh, they are available. Um, so you can see them if you'd like. But I, wanna, I, I, I don't usually do a call to action, but I'm going to begin to do that, I think, as we're going into, uh, into the coming year. Um, and you know, I'd ask, you know, what's next for you? It's great to come to an event and observe an event and take part in an event. But part of the way that, um, that reflective thinking or part of what we, we take with us, um, you know, what's next for you? What is it that, that you got out of this event that you want to take with you? Um, are there action steps that you want to take? Are there, is there a particular help as you're listening that you think, you know what? I could use some help in a particular type of a thing. You know, um, before you leave, let's, you know, connect in some sort of way or leave a, a name or a phone number if it's something that has to do with branding or graphic. Uh, designed and absolutely, I know Christiane would make herself available for that. And um, you know, uh, I have found that over this year I've become a connector. Uh, so I always ask people, you know, who are you looking for? Who would be helpful for you to know? What types of, uh, if it's an industry or if it's an individual person, if it's a company, um, you know, leave me a note. Let me know. Get my card, and we'll see uh, if we can try and make that connection happen for you. Um, you know, as I mentioned, Start of Grind is something that we do monthly. And I'm super psyched that our January guest is actually in the house tonight. Uh, Heather Dwyer uh, from Semilox is here. Um, so we will be uh, doing our next Startup Grind on January the 14th. Um, so I invite you to come right back here to uh, Over It Media. Um, you know, um, early bird tickets for that are already on sale. So those of you who would like a bargain at this time of the Christmas season, uh, you can go online and you can get that. But um, Christiane, I just want to thank you. This has been awesome, which I knew it was going to be. Thank you. My pleasure. Um, so I'm really glad uh, that we were able to close out our first year uh, with you. And thank so, you. Um, you know, just thank you all for being here. Uh, and if there's, you know, anything that we can do, then please let us know. And I think that we are complete. So thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you.